Mr. Grohl, what progress is the Basin Electric making here in North Dakota? Well, at our board meeting uh, yesterday and today, the board awarded contracts in an amount of uh, $768,000 for about uh, four more of the major components of the plant. The uh, design work is on schedule, and we expect to start construction in June. Mr. Grohl, are there any changes in the membership of Basin Electric? Uh, yes, Fred, there are. The board was uh, pleased to uh, accept into membership today Verendry Electric Cooperative of North Dakota. Uh, this new member brings our total membership to 66 distribution cooperatives serving people in parts of seven states in the Missouri Basin. What about Dakota's Electric? Uh, the Dakota's Electric Board of Directors voted on December 29 to apply for membership to Basin Electric, and we have their application. However, the, uh, the Dakota's vote uh, was on the condition that the board consider it again at the February 7 meeting, and the Dakota's Electric Board asked Basin Electric not to act on their application until after the next meeting of the Dakota's board. The Basin Electric Board uh, passed a resolution today in the full Dakota's Electric that we would be pleased to welcome them into membership if their application stands after their next board meeting. As progress is made with Basin here in the state, it means that money is going to be spent and deposited were there any financial arrangements made for the use, uh, how this money will be used here in the state? Yes, the, uh, after consideration at several uh, previous board meetings, our board uh, decided today to authorize the execution of a contract arrangement with the Banker State Bank and Trust Company of North Dakota, under which uh, our operating funds and our reserve funds will be handled by the Bank of State Bank and Trust Company and deposited in 30 or more uh, locally owned banks in North Dakota. We will use the uh, Bank of North Dakota as our, the depository for the master account under this arrangement. Senator Burdick, uh, President Johnson, in his address to the Congress, there was not only a beautiful eulogy of words that has been going on for, since last weekend, but there was a eulogy in terms of action on the part of Congress and the problems facing it. What was the reaction in the Congress as you listened to the speech with your colleagues, and uh, what hope is there for Congress acting? Well, of course, I thought that the speech was very well received, and we all hope, and I think that is the mood of the country, that we move faster. And uh, as you know, we have six appropriation bills left, to move on, we have the two big issues of civil rights and tax reduction. As far as I'm concerned, I'm willing to stay there, we're done. We had a vote on Wednesday that determined some priority. Uh, Twenty of us supported a faster move than some wanted, but I think the Congress and the mood of the public will cause this Congress to move faster in the days ahead. Uh, knowing uh, President Johnson, as you do, uh, Senator Burdick, do you think that this man as president is going to be able to get the Congress to move on domestic issues uh, in this, when you reconvene in January? I think he will. Bear in mind that the president has had 32 years of experience on the Hill in the Congress, so to speak. And uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful that he uses his vast knowledge of the legislative process to uh, bring strong support behind his program, and I think he will. Senator, uh, another big domestic question in this section of the country is wheat, the wheat problem, the, uh, the uh, farm program. Uh, what's going to happen to that, do you think, under uh, President Johnson and the, uh, his administration? Well, of course, Johnson is from East Texas. His roots are in the rural areas, and I expect him to be very sympathetic toward the farm question and farm problems. Now the whole problem before Congress is today is to get a unified front among the farm groups and farm organizations to push a, a better farm bill. And uh, I'm very uh, uh, concerned about this because as the law reads now, uh, wheat will drop to $1.25 a bushel. 
And so I think we have to act and uh, act quickly on the, on the farm question and the farm front. And I think the president will be very sympathetic with that view. Governor, if this group is successful in referring these four tax measures, and you say that you're going to call then a special election, what do you see to be the consequences uh, to the state of North Dakota? I believe it depends upon when these uh, petitions are filed with the Secretary of State, if they are filed. Uh, we have decided that this referral action uh, should be brought to a special election as soon as we could legally call a special election after the petitions are legally filed, if they are filed. This would mean a special election would take place approximately 30 days following the filing of these petitions with the Secretary of State. Of course, the Committee of Petitioners have control of when these petitions would be filed. They have up until June 7th to file these petitions, and so uh, to try to project when a special election might be called uh, depends entirely on the action of the committee petitioning these tax measures. Governor, if the tax measures were thrown out by the voters in a special uh, uh, election, and you called a special session of the legislature, when would you do this, and still what would be the consequences to North Dakota? The tax measures being referred were passed by the last session of the legislature to go into effect on July 1st of this year. If the petitions are filed in sufficient time so that a special election could be held to determine whether the voters would approve of these tax measures or vote to throw these tax measures out, if this election uh, could be held in sufficient time before July 1st, then the legislature could be called in special session to reenact tax laws, provided, of course, the people vote out in this referendum the tax measures passed by the last session. However, if the petitioners uh, in this referral action were to wait until their maximum 90-day time limit, or June 7th, this, of course, would mean that the special election would be held after July 1st, and uh, then there would be a necessary interval after the election uh, in which time uh, the special session would be called. Now, after July 1st, if these tax measures are voted down by the people, we will start losing state revenue uh, through the sales tax, uh, probably in excess of $52,000 a day. And so you can see that uh, waiting until the last minute to file these petitions and an extended special session of the legislature could result in substantial tax loss to the state of North Dakota. Governor, uh, is this not true that the legislature jackpotted many of these funds and this would affect, uh, uh, at the worst, uh, almost everything in North Dakota? Schools it is. Colleges and it schools? That's true. We used to have dedicated equalization funds from the sales tax revenue for welfare and primary and secondary education. The last session of the legislature did away with these dedicated funds, and now all higher education, primary and secondary education, and welfare uh, payments come from the general fund. And so any tax revenue loss will immediately affect welfare and education. What about the, how much thought, Governor, has been given to calling a special session of the legislature right now? Uh, Fred, the referral laws were intentionally set up to allow the public, the voting public, to pass on any action of the legislature. Uh, perhaps there are ways which the referral law could be circumvented, for example, calling an immediate session, special session of the legislature. I don't believe this was the intent of the Constitution to circumvent a referral action, and I have no plan at this time to call a special session uh, in an attempt to circumvent the action of the petitioners in the referral of, of these tax measures. Representative Link, do you think that adequate research is going into where the money is going to come from, from the taxes, to make up this gap between the expenditures and the uh, income of state government. Fred, when you speak of adequate research, 
to me that means a, a thorough study as to the amounts of money that will reasonably be expected raised from any new tax proposal, the, their effect upon the individuals and uh, the measure within which they will come in closing this gap. This type of research cannot be accomplished in a 60-day session and that is one of the reasons why I believe this legislature is going to find it difficult to settle on any one or two or three measures with any certainty is because adequate research is not available. Mr. Link, uh, 15 days that remain in this session isn't enough time? Not to adequately appraise the effect or the income that we need. Uh, the unfortunate thing of this lack of research, in my opinion, is that in desperation, um, a quick solution may be uh, sought, something that none of us want. There might be a long 60th day in this session? I certainly would not uh, uh, eliminate that possibility, Fred. Well, Fred, you know, we have received some petitions quite a bit ahead of the closing date. And we start checking them the minute they hit our office. And then Friday night, we stayed open till 12 o'clock. And then during that time, me and one of my office staff were checking them during that time. And when the final finals were filed, we closed the office, which was 12 o'clock. And the next day, part of my office staff was up there checking the petitions. And they were up Sunday and checking them on Monday. So we found them to be sufficient and they're filed and they're certified out to the county auditor. They uh, had more than enough. Mr. Meyer, I understand that under North Dakota law that even if a petition does not have sufficient signatures or after the filing date or if there are errors, that there are still a number of days that they can uh, correct the petition. Now, Fred, they have to have not less than 7,000, but if they're in not valid signatures. That means if they have forgotten their residence on there or forgot the date in there or their post office address, they have the right to make the corrections, the petitioners, 20 days after I reject them. But they do not have any time to add any signatures. They cannot add signatures to it. Just off, uh, uh, just off the top of your head, Ben, do you know how many signatures were filed on these petitions? Uh, well, uh, there were uh, some of the measures had uh, over 12,000, and some were around 8,000, the lowest. What about the publicity pamphlet now? Are you getting any advertising in uh, with your deadline coming up this next week? Uh, not yet. So far, we haven't had anybody inquiring. Do you think there's some reluctance to advertise on, on in, the, in the publicity pamphlet on these issues? I don't know about that, but I believe there won't be much advertising. I think the majority of the people uh, figure that it's up to the people now to make the decision. It's in the people's hands, and I have a lot of faith in the public. Mr. Frazee, what, uh, what is the mechanics of this special election that North Dakota is now heading into? Well, on Thursday of this week, the governor issued a proclamation uh, setting forth and calling for a statewide special election on the five measures that were referred. This was done as a result of the Secretary of State having certified to the governor prior to that time that the petitions were sufficient and the required number of signatures had been obtained. Then after the proclamation is issued by the governor, the uh, Secretary of State then certifies the petitions or the measures to the county auditors of each county in North Dakota. At that time, the county auditors proceed to, with the requirements under the statute, to give notice of the special election and also to uh, proceed with the other me mechanics that may be necessary, such as printing the ballot and so on. This election, of course, as you know, is on July 17th of this year. And, and it will include all of the
five measures that were previously filed with the Secretary of State. Uh, does this uh, close then the legal mechanical uh, processes of the governor's office, uh, Mr. Frazee? The procedure that uh, you've already gone through? Well, for the for the most part, um, this would start the the uh, entire proceedings, and uh, there would be other matters that perhaps the governor's office would be interested in during the course of the time before the election on Ju July 17th. Mr. Speaker, the House is in recess. Now, today is Saturday. What legislative day is it? Well, actually, we are still on our 45th legislative day. Uh, we did not adjourn. We merely recessed, and we actually recessed until Monday at 1 o'clock. Mr. Speaker, what's the status in terms of the revenue bills to close the gap between state expenditures and income? Well, that's a, certainly a good question. From the majority <laughs> party's point of view. <laughs> uh, we have, uh, I think you should realize, that we do have the vehicles by which we can implement revenue producing measures. That is, there are, that I know of, two income tax measures available to us. I believe both of those will now be in the House, a withholding tax feature and also a income tax, a state income tax proposal with a surtax. Those, I believe, now have been messaged over to the House. Is this a enough revenue to close what seems to be agreement yet of $17 million gap? Well, we also, of course, have a sales tax measure. In fact, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that there are two sales tax measures still alive. And, of course, in the end, we'll only need one sales tax measure. But uh, to date, we have more or less just reenacted the old sales tax law. Do you expect, anticipate a long 60th day? Uh, that is quite probable because uh, we have a great deal to do in these remaining two weeks or 15 days. There no doubt will be some differences of opinion between the House and the Senate. It will be a matter now of trying to find out a common ground that is acceptable to both the House and the Senate. Mr. Jamerson, I know you're working on Indian problems and affairs here at the state legislature on this 45th day. How are the Indians faring here in the legislature? Well, the uh, Standing Rock Sioux and the other North Dakota Indian tribes have been following this uh, Senate Bill 30 every day, and we've had delegations up here keeping an eye on it. But the way things look now, uh, we are very grateful for the broad-mindedness and the thinking of the 38th legislature in amending the bill to give us consent in uh, rather, whether to accept jurisdiction or turn it down. But, in other uh, words, you're going to have a chance to vote on this? Yes, sir. And uh, I would suggest this and recommend this highly to the 38th legislature that uh, if they're so hell-bent on assuming jurisdiction, they look into the field of assuming jurisdiction in the Indian Bureau, over the Indian Bureau. Mrs. Conrad, let's talk about some of the facts regarding UNICEF. Who supports UNICEF nationally? UNICEF is supported by almost everyone. Uh, most of the people in the United States know about UNICEF and support it. Uh, such figures as President Kennedy, former President Eisenhower, uh, former Vice President Nixon, Henry Cabot Lodge, uh, the American Council of Churches, the American Jewish Committee, the uh, Catholic Church of this country, and, it, and Pope John, uh, all of these people support UNICEF, uh, both uh, morally and by their financial contributions and their uh, support for the financial drives of, the, uh, of UNICEF. Mrs. Conrad, who supports UNICEF in North Dakota? Well, in North Dakota, there is no organized effort for UNICEF. The communities that uh, conduct the Halloween trick-or-treat uh, drive for UNICEF do so on their own. I don't believe there's ever been anyone in North Dakota to organize communities to support UNICEF. The, it's been spontaneous uh, support on the part of the people of each local community. 
that has resulted in drives in a great many of our cities and towns. Mrs. Conrad, why the sudden opposition that's cropped up here in, in some areas of North Dakota to UNICEF, in your opinion? Well, I think this is uh, just a manifestation of the uh, opposition to the United Nations, that these are people who uh, oppose any phase of the United Nations. This gives people an opportunity to participate in uh, something for the United Nations. It gives us, uh, as local citizens, an opportunity to help. And I think this is one of the things that they very much oppose, and that it's uh, merely another uh, way in which they can oppose the United Nations itself. Mr. Iverson, in your report to the North Dakota Education Association meeting, you said that uh, education in this state is being downgraded in the past year or so. What are the reasons for this? Well, my reason for stating that is largely on the basis that this downgrading is more a result, probably of something that's been happening unconsciously probably throughout the state. The public generally doesn't realize the good job of educating that's been done generally in North Dakota by teachers. I think it's safe to say that the, the most money that the taxpayer in North Dakota gets for his dollar is in education. The point I was making was this, that we are taking education for granted. We are taking excellence in education for granted. That can't be done. Because as other things improve, education must improve too. And we haven't been making the increased efforts in education that we have towards increasing some of our other cultural advantages. Mr. Iverson, you also said that there, in your report uh, here at the convention, that there have been more attacks upon teachers and upon uh, schools and on education generally. What accounts for this? Well, of course, here in North Dakota, we probably had fewer of those attacks than there have been generally in the nation, but we have had some. It looks to me like it's part of a general pattern. People get frustrated when they see things going the way they don't want them to go. Somebody or some institution, some place, must be the whipping boy. And it seems like generally education is the most convenient. Mr. Iverson, what's the number one problem in education in North Dakota? Well, Fred, there's no question in our minds, but what the number one problem for some time and continues to be that of school finance. We still don't seem to be able to come on up with the answers to where we're going to find the money to do the job we're talking about. Everybody seems to be agreed that we should have quality education for our North Dakota youngsters. We want to do what's right by them. We want them to have an education that will permit them to take their place alongside of others, wherever they may happen to go in the United States. But we seem to think that we can do it on finance standards that are probably outdated 10 years ago. Audrey, uh, tomorrow morning you are leaving for Bolivia and your assignment in the Peace Corps. How difficult did you find the training uh, for this uh, a program, Audrey? Well, I didn't really find it difficult as far as I was concerned because I enjoyed every minute of training from beginning to end, although the hours were a little long sometimes. Uh, it was still great fun. But uh, what, what was the emphasis in the, in the program, your training program? Uh, well, the whole training was to get us in condition uh, to live in a foreign country, being able to accept the way they live in conjunction with the way we live, learning. I suppose you're st studying Spanish. <laughs> yeah, we've had uh, about uh, 250 hours of Spanish up to this point, and of course, many extra hours in studying. Audrey, in your training program for the Peace Corps, what's been your most exciting uh, time that you've had? The most exciting time was in Puerto Rico in the physical fitness program. Uh, I really enjoyed this because it gave me a chance to do so many things that I never, ever would have had a chance to do before. And the greatest thrill I got is when we repelled off of a 100-foot uh, rocky ledge. And uh, this was just a terrific experience. I really enjoyed this. Audrey, uh, in Bolivia, 
You're a farm girl, North Dakota. What are you going to be doing uh, in the Peace Corps? I'll be working specifically with co-ops and uh, accounting. They do have uh, cooperatives down there, and we will be helping them uh, with better methods, uh, helping them to function better. And at this time, I don't know exactly what I will be doing, but it is in the line of cooperatives. Mr. Zelski, uh, it's nearly Christmas again. Uh, what kind of judgment uh, should be exercised in terms of buying a Christmas tree? Well, Fred, the same judgment would be used here as you would in most any purchase. I just use a little common sense. What you're after is a perishable product that should last out the season you buy it for. In other words, you'd like to have it at least through Christmas, what many people would like to carry it through New Year's, without shedding those needles. That means when you go for this Christmas tree, try to pick out one that's fresh. Uh, if it's a, uh, let's say, a warm lot or a heated lot, by heated I don't mean up at 70 degrees, I mean above freezing. Pick out one that the needles are flexible, that it's a nice full tree, has good color, and it fits in, in every way that you know how that, of the tree that you want at home. Then by all means, and I don't think we can emphasize this too much, buy it from a reputable lot. Somebody who will be in business this year, and next year, and the year after. So should there be an error, and there can be errors where accidents say in piles or in bunches and we well we just had a guess and many a time we guessed wrong well there is better merchandising going on but one still sees it what kind of uh, are there going to be north dakota growing trees on the market this year john fred we'll have some north dakota trees again this year oh perhaps not as many as last year i would have guessed that a cut this year would be about 400 again it'll be from the vm farm up in the northeast part of the state now this will, will be our low season in trees so to speak because with the coming of the 64 season, we'll have other plantations coming into production. So then we'll start picking up rather rapidly in Christmas tree production and sales at that time. This is sort of betwixt and between. We've had the trial planting, primarily harvested last year. This is the follow-up, finishing off that planting, and then the new plantings come in next year. Mr. Burley, what will be the basic points for farmers in the 1963 feed grain sign-up? Well, Fred, the 1963 feed grain program offers farmers the opportunity of diverting from 20 to 40 percent of their feed grain base to soil conserving uh, uses and for this they will receive diversion payments. A farmer who has a feed grain base of 25 acres or less may divert the entire base and receive diversion payments. Uh, the uh, producer is eligible for uh, price support on his barley or corn uh, if he is in compliance with the program, he is also eligible for a what is known as a price support payment, which in the case of corn is 18 cents, on barley is 14 cents. In fact, this payment of what I refer to as the price support payment is available to the farmer whether the feed is sold on the cash market, uh, that is, goes into the regular channels of trade, or is fed to livestock on the farm. I might say there will be no special barley program this year. Mr. Burley, what will be the basic points in the 1963 this year's wheat program? In the 1963 wheat program, first of all, we are on a national allotment of 55 million acres, so there is an increased allotment over uh, last year. And there will be payments offered to farmers who divert anywhere from 20 to 50 percent of their wheat base. The, uh, uh, there will be, in addition, what is known as a price support payment of 18 cents a bushel to those who comply, making the effective price support of $2 a bushel. The sign-up, of course, is simultaneous with feed grains, February 1 to uh, March 22nd. And the purpose of these supply management programs uh, are basically four in number. Uh, to provide income protection to the farmer, to reduce production costs, to improve the surplus or supply situation, and it will also provide better farming through putting additional land to soil conserving uses. Mr. Omdahl, what kind of reorganization administration are you proposing for the tax department that you are taking over on Monday morning? Well, Fred, uh, when you talk about reorganization, I might point out that there are some very good people working in the tax department and that the tax department is in no worse shape than several other agencies in state government. 
but there is a good deal to be done in the tax department. In the first place, what the tax department really needs is direction, and I expect to give the tax department